my colleagues Rob Bertini, Jennifer Dill, and uh, John Glebe, and myself, Chris Monsier. We organized this uh, Friday Transportation Seminar. Today we're very pleased to have Julie Rodwell. Uh, who's going to talk to us about, from, uh, from the Oregon DOT Freight Mobility Office, is going to talk to us about state and national freight issues. Um, Julie was very kind and helped us fill the cancellation at the last minute, so she deserves extra thanks. So, um, and just as a reminder, we'll, we have people on the web, and so use the microphone, and uh, I'll be enforcing that policy today. So. Thank you. So I have a lot of slides, and I can talk forever about this subject because it's quite at least interesting to me anyway. I have some handouts. I have 10 sets of the full um, uh, PowerPoint presentation that are here. And then I have an overview uh, that's just, you know, the outline of what I'm going to cover, which is in here anyway. So I'll pass these around. <clears throat> so what is going on in freight? And, okay, I get to see myself. That's really weird. Okay, so this is the overview. I'm going to talk about why freight matters, freight forecasts and trends both in Oregon and nationally, uh, top issues both in Oregon and nationally. Um, I say paradigm shift, we'll talk about that, change in mindset. What's going on to ramp up to deal with freight, again, both locally and nationally? Um, unmet needs in Oregon, uh, how to meet the needs, some discussion about that anyway, because we're far from knowing the answers. And a few personal observations on oh, and stakeholders is just a little aside in there, but that's an important one. And I wanted just to say, too, any opinions you hear are my personal opinions. When you read something into this that's an opinion more than a fact, it's probably mine. Um, this is not necessarily an ODOT-endorsed um, presentation, but uh, uh, hopefully that will provoke some discussion. <clears throat> okay, so who has ever eaten a pizza? <laughs> All right. Anybody not ever eaten a pizza? All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, or a sandwich. Here we have a sandwich on the front bench. Um, so let's think about what that means in terms of freight mobility. Uh, what's in a pizza? There's, there's grain, right? There's probably wheat. wheat. Where's, where's the wheat going to come from? Midwest. The Midwest. Oregon is one of the biggest wheat producers, Idaho, Washington. Okay, so that's that part. What else is in a pizza? Cheese. cheese. So where does cheese come from around here? <laughs> okay, Tillamook, Wisconsin, uh, France, you know, the cheese country of the world probably, but a lot of places, some of them far away. Uh, what else are you going to have in a pizza? Olives? Tomatoes. tomatoes. So where are tomatoes going to come from this time of year? Mexico, Mexico maybe Chile or further afield. Uh, olives? California. California, maybe Sicily, Italy. Um, anchovies? <laughs> I, think, I think the world's best anchovies are probably from Spain, um, but I think they probably come from a number of places. Now, let's say we add to this delicious thing um, some uh, pineapple as well. Where, where, where might that come from? Okay, so when you, when you think about something as simple as a pizza, there's all kinds of different movements involved in getting those raw ingredients to the pizza shop and putting them together. We forgot a few things. We forgot the olive oil, and I'm sure there's lots of other garnishes that could be counted. There's the cardboard box, and then it comes in a little vehicle to your house. Well, that's a very complex process for a meal that takes half an hour at the most to eat, right? And when we think about anything else, if you started peeling off your clothes and looking at the labels, where is, where's your clothing coming from these days? China is a top place. But there's a lot of other places. I mean, you'll read Thailand, Manila, you name it. Not a whole lot from this country. Um, so when people think about freight, they think about that annoying, you know, 18-wheeler in front of them on the highway. But in reality, it should have a bumper sticker on it saying, bringing your stuff to you. Or, you know, if a truck, if you bought it, a truck brought it. And we don't, we don't necessarily always think about that, but we need to get people more aware of that. Anyway, moving along. So in Oregon, there are really three kinds of freight movements, and they overlap, but it's useful to think of them in these categories. 
First of all, the made in Oregon. Uh, what do we produce here? We talked about grain. Produce. Produce, timber, fish. What else? Wine. Wine is one. Aggregate is one, surprisingly. Um, and there are other products that come from within Oregon, and they change over time. You know, we're a huge uh, provider of grass seed to the world. Uh, we now sell that grass hay to Japan. It's baled up and compacted as a return trip because otherwise uh, the container would be empty a lot of the time. And you wouldn't think that was a big deal, but it's a billion-dollar market in Oregon at the moment. Now, that could change, but it's avoiding having to do a lot of burning, and that was something that just evolved in the last decade or so. So first of all, obviously, we need freight mobility to get the things our state's producing to markets so that we as a state can earn our living. And I always put that first. Um, the second is we're a gateway state. There's a lot of stuff coming across the Pacific and usually getting onto a train at the Port of Portland and going to Chicago and points east. So we're a throughput state to some extent for all that stuff. Not near as much as California, and we'll get to that later, but that's another role we play. And then last but not least is goods to your table, gas to your tank. We have very little of a pipeline system here. The gasoline is mostly coming in by tanker after it crosses the river from Washington, but at that point on, there's very little distribution that's coming in tankers to the, to the gas stations. And all the other things that you want to buy, they're coming to stores from distribution centers, and then they're getting to your house. And so we're, we're um, if you think about it in these three ways, I think it's a useful starting point. Um, it's growing really fast, both nationwide and in Oregon. And we'll talk a little bit about why. We are an export state, um, ninth highest of any state in the union in terms of our trade dependency. I've uh, said we are a gateway. The, um, this is both a good thing in terms of high paying jobs, particularly in the port, um, but also a bad thing in the sense that our capacity is used up to serve people in Chicago and points east rather than serving our own people, which is an issue. And we'll get back to that when we talk about the railroads. And then the last point on this is a, a really important one, that being, being tied to the global economy in an increasing way means we're at the mercy, if you will, of world policies on trade, NAFTA, WTO, the economies around the world. And to be involved in this, you have to have a grasp of what's going on in the world economy. Um, so this is not something you might necessarily get if you're training as an engineer or something you're going to need. So what's going on in terms of growth? This is a little bit busy, but we're looking at a huge amount of growth in truck. Um, so um, let me see if this is clear enough. This is millions of tons, millions of ton miles, and this is um, billions of dollars. Um, and we're looking at um, where it's going and I'm sorry, this isn't clear enough. I don't have enough of a caption on it, but... Um, it's, it's, it's billions it, of ton miles. That's it, it is. It's shorter than the million. <laughs> Thank you. It is, isn't it? It is, isn't it? Is Thank you for reading that. Yes, you, you're absolutely right. Um, but in general, we're talking about a massive increase. And um, let me go on to the next one. We're, we've got the problem that even though the highway system is very congested, the other parts of the system either can't handle the traffic too well, uh, either it's not suitable or they're also at capacity. The rail system is tremendously at capacity. Now what this slide shows is uh, at least one forecaster's opinion that we're going to become a more trade dependent country. Now I personally disagree a little bit with this. I think it's a risky place to go. I was raised in England where, um, you know, during World War II we couldn't get a lot of food because we were so dependent. Two thirds of England's food was coming from other places and it was not able to get through so we were living on carrots and potatoes and you know and didn't see an orange for a long time and I was born at the end of World War II and I can remember when sugar was still rationed and when it came off rationing big excitement you could now buy candy um, but uh, being in that position where we're more dependent on the rest of the world 
um, I think is not something we just want to slide into because that's what the trend is. I think we really need to think about it. Anyway, um, what is the growth triggered by? First of all, population growth. Um, we're looking at probably, does anyone have national figures? We're, we're close to 300 million now. We'll, we'll be getting up to easily 350 million in your lifetimes, maybe more. We have a huge consumer market, and a lot of our trade has gone overseas, so obviously we're now buying from overseas because it's not cost effective to create that stuff here. We've got other trends going on in industry. This, anyone heard of just-in-time delivery? So uh, the, basically the shippers are trying to um, operate on very tight delivery schedules. And the distribution center may have a 15-minute window when a certain load is supposed to come in. And there's, there's lots of problems with it not being adhered to. A factory may have all its components coming in on this just-in-time basis. So if something falls apart in that system, they may have to send people home. It's very reliant on fine-tuning. Um, but it also means that for the transportation system, as I put here in this slide, the warehouses now have wheels. Instead of backspace in the store, it's on the highway. And whether it's stuck in traffic or whether it's moving, they've shifted from a, a essentially a private sector burden of providing that floor space to a public sector burden of handling that on, on the highway system in particular. And then, although it's a, a little bit of an unknown to quantify, the whole business of internet sales, and when you order something online, then the ultimate end result of that is a small van like a UPS van coming to your door. Now, in some cases where it has to be signed for, they may come three times. So there's a lot of vehicle miles traveled attached to internet sales, and no one's really done the analysis. Does that cancel out the trips to the mall that you would have made otherwise? Um, but we have a lot more local truck traffic because of that, and we're still really trying to get a handle on it, and Bob Shake nodding his head. We, the whole business of freight data is extremely challenging, and I'm not going to delve into that today because we're at the sort of 50,000 level. But anyway, there are all these reasons for growth and probably more, and at the end I'll talk about some reasons why I think it's not necessarily believable in the long run. Um, here we have some estimates that were done for Oregon. These are just growth rates. So we're looking at over 3% per annum for truck. Um, aviation's growing really fast. And this is a forecast through 2030. Um, aviation's growing fast on a very small base. There isn't a lot that lends itself to being flown because it has to be high value, low bulk. Um, but there is a lot of capacity there. Rail is not forecast to grow very much because there really isn't the capacity as well as some products just don't lend themselves. Water has capacity, but again, it's a very slow mode and not necessarily suitable for a lot of things. And then, um, the pipeline is missing. Well, the reason for that is that environmentally, we're not going to build any more pipelines, not the hazardous liquid anyway. There may be gas pipelines in Oregon, but the environmental effort for that is just not possible. Um, I put in a supply chain picture, and you'll hear, if you get into freight, much more about supply chains. This is, um, this is over in China. A lawn chair is being made. It's being shipped on a big container vessel comes into the port of Portland. At the terminal, it gets onto trucks. They go to distribution centers. In this case, this is Fred Meyer, some to Chehalis and some to um, Clackamas. I'm, I'm not able to read this too well. <laughs> so then you've got all your Fred Meyer stores, and you all come and buy your lawn chairs and take them home. And that kind of a supply chain um, is the way it works for any commodity. So when you think about, for example, the wheat growers supply chain, there's actually two ends to it. There's the supply chain in with the seed, the pesticide, the fertilizer, the farm equipment, and there's a supply chain out of grain, and then there may be another product going from the flour mill, you know, milled grain. And, and so there are all these links in the chain, and to keep the system working, of course, you can't have any broken links. So that's kind of one of the new buzzwords, I guess. 
Um, this slide talks about, from a national perspective, what are some of the issues. And the TRB took a look at, at nine issues that they, they um, um, felt were the top ones. These are in alphabetical order. They're not in order of importance. Um, and I bolded the ones that seem to apply most to freight. Congestion, finance, which we'll get to, and infrastructure, meaning aging infrastructure. So we know we've got congestion with freight growing so fast and pavement just not growing to the same degree or rights of way. Um, the finance thing's a huge issue, which I'll touch on in a minute. Uh, driver labor shortages in the in the trucking industry particularly, but also in the railroads, it's, they're having a great deal of difficulty getting people. And the long distance trucking especially is just, for a lot of people, not a very appealing job. Um, but, but huge turnover, more than 100% per year in the trucking business. Uh, and that's, that's not throughout the whole system. For instance, Walmart has its own fleet and their people tend to stick around longer and there's lots of people who've been at it for years but as an average it's turning over really fast and then infrastructure just the system um, is both aging and not necessarily sized to freight may not have the height the weight the length we're doing a study of highway 140 between medford and the nevada border and one section of that highway has 66 curves in a four mile section on a hill and the larger trucks the 53 foot trailers with the rig cannot legally go that route. So we don't ha have a viable east-west system in that area. So that was TRB's take on what are some of the issues. And then Ashto this year did a survey of their, um, of the state uh, DOTs, some of the metropolitan planning organizations and the federal highway local offices. And they came up with, again, congestion uh, the need to expand and upgrade the highway system, infrastructure in general, again, I mean, meaning aging system. They added truck size and weight issues, which I'll touch on briefly, intermodal connections and facilities, and two things related, access to the Class 1 railroads and diverting traffic to rail. Um, so the next few slides are going to talk about some of these issues. Um, just in a real overview, the capacity issue as I've touched on, we built the interstate system 50 years ago, and we haven't substantially expanded it since that whole round of construction. There's bits here and there, but nothing massive. Um, the railroads, it's been a very checkered career for them. The railroad system peaked in trackage in about 1939 and has gone down ever since. The, the rights of way may still be there, but they pulled up tracks sometimes just to sell the steel for money to survive. And they laid off massive numbers of people, partly because they had a lot of feather bedding in the 70s and earlier years. And then when trucking deregulation came along and they had to really compete harder, um, they laid off more people and tried to really restructure. And they kind of, um, you know, narrowed down and focused. And so the recent growth of the last five or six years has caught them a little bit unprepared. And um, they don't really have the profit margins to do the kind of investment that's needed to build the kind of rail system we may want if we don't want to choke the highways. Um, the marine system is very, very important, but there are lots of battles in Congress about getting the funding um, for just maintenance of jetties and uh, channel deepening and locks and wharves. and um, and so that system is really a kind of crumbling infrastructure. It's got the capacity, but it's also at risk. And then aviation I mentioned, and then pipeline I also mentioned. So that's the kind of overall picture. Um, the highway system, you can imagine, for instance, I used to live in the Seattle area, and they're trying to widen Highway 4, 405 through Bellevue. Some places there, it'll have to be double-decked because the the land, all the condos and all the other commercial activity, there's no way to get land at any reasonable price. So they're working within that narrow right-of-way. Of course, it's really too bad that they didn't do what Toronto did, which is back in the 60s. Toronto built a 16-laden freeway across the north of the city so you could get from east to west on this huge system that back when I lived there, which was early, about 1970, wasn't really at capacity except in peak times. 
And now, of course, they're going, well, isn't that great? We built a 16-lane highway, whereas around here we've got at most, what, six lanes, occasionally eight lanes. Um, so we didn't think ahead. We didn't really believe that the car would dominate our lives <laughs> the way it is doing. Um, and we've got an issue because we've built this big system and a massive amount of our income in all states is just going to maintaining what we have. Uh, about a billion dollars a year in Oregon is just going to maintain the built system, let alone having any money for expansion. Um, and we know, too, from everything we've done in the last 30 years that you can't build your way out of congestion. The more lane miles you add, the busier things seem to get. And one of, one of the ways out is transportation systems management through things like ITS, Intelligent Transportation Systems, um, which Rob is a much greater expert on than I am. And, and another, you know, other ways, what, what ways are there to get out of this? Well, switching modes. Uh, some modest building, but um, money is very tight for any of these things, and um, it, isn't, it isn't clear where we're going. And the bottom point there, the OTIA, Oregon Transportation Improvement Program, which is about three, three four billion dollars of road and bridge improvement that we've been doing, that we're still doing, that's a bonded thing against our normal revenue. And by the time we pay the bonds off, it'll be about 2030, and by then, the work we're doing will need doing again. You know, how long does an improvement last on a bridge or a highway? So we've, we've mortgaged the future in order to stay alive, and obviously that's not really the best of strategies. Um, so preserving what we have is one thing, um, but building is another. Another issue that came up on the Ashto list was truck size and weight. And as you know, in Oregon, we have triple trailers. This is more efficient for the trucking company, uh, but does create some issues with everybody else. And um, it's a national issue. It's been a very jumbled and contentious issue. But obviously, the industry would like to have triples nationwide, except perhaps in some choke points where it isn't realistic. And right now, that's a very chaotic subject. So if you want to get into it, uh, I could certainly provide more. I'm not going to dwell on it now. Um, one of the things about freight that we don't always realize, the, the modes work very closely together. When I showed you that supply chain picture, often um, the moves are from marine to rail to truck. So rail and truck work closely together, but there's also conflicts as the system gets busier. And um, anyway, uh, National Highway System Intermodal Connectors. Supposedly, the last mile of the highway system where it ties to a freight facility, uh, that's what's uh, um, an intermodal connector. But right now, under Safety Lou, that program was defunded. So this, it's a good idea, but there's no money on it. Uh, <coughs> Diverting to rail and access to Class 1 railroads. I think some of you know a bit about this issue. Um, the, the topic is definitely a hot one nationwide. We have a situation in Oregon where the short lines and some of the smaller shippers are complaining that they can't get service or they can't get reasonably priced service, they can't get reliable service. Um, because the class ones are basically saying, all right, we're suddenly super busy, and we didn't have a massive amount of capacity. Um, we're going to cherry pick the profitable customers. We still have to make a profit. We're still a private business. We're on the stock exchange. We've got to look good. And so we're not going to necessarily serve everybody. We're going to make it quite difficult for some people to get service because we're really not interested. What they're interested in is the hook and haul, which means a 110-car unit train, everything the same commodity, going all to the same place, which is efficient for them, as opposed to pick up two or three cars here and drop off two or three cars there uh, on and off as you wend your way east. Um, so it's become a big challenge. It's, it's a big issue in Congress right now, and I'll give you a bit more information. Here's a picture of the Union Pacific's network and they are our most important class one carrier. So you can see their line up here in the Portland area, down the Columbia Gorge, 
and then a line coming down this way. This is actually more or less ends in Eugene, and then it's a short line beyond that down here, and I'll show you another map in a minute. And then the main line goes over and goes through Klamath Falls and up here. So that's our coverage from the UP, and you can see how big and busy some of the rest of the country is. So we are kind of on the tail end of the system, and when we ask them, okay, what are your points of focus, guess what? It's around here and here and here. So they're not necessarily putting a whole lot of investments in Oregon. They don't see that as where their crunch points are. Um, and this is just one of the pictures they provided about where they're at. They know they've got excess demand, and they're more or less letting it just um, die on the vine. Um, here's the Burlington Northern Le Network. We've got um, a little bit of service up in this corridor between Portland and Eugene, and then they have trackage down the middle of the state. There's some places where the UP and the BN operate on each other's tracks. But again, the majority of the system is in other places and much denser. Um, and this is a, an indicator from them about what's going on in the way of growth. And um, so let's see if we can figure out this legend. Yeah, they've got a color for each year, what's going on. So this is their monthly pattern by year. And this is what's going on in 2005. And um, it, it, it's continuing to go <laughs> up and up. So. Um, both the class ones are in the same position. Um, I put in this picture of the Rivergate area. Anybody know where that is in Portland? So the the zone with the port and all, you can see all the different rail spurs that serve different wharves in the port system. And that port rail connection is extremely important. And there is a lot of opportunity for improvement of the rail connection to the ports. But it's going to take a lot of money. Um, and this slide came from a collaboration of the West Coast Cardo Coalition, where on the West Coast in general, this is what was agreed are some of the issues. Um, but I'm going to skip over because um, Oregon is so tiny compared with the rest of the West Coast. Let me, um, we'll come back to that point. This is just a map of the short lines. So we have something like 20 short lines in Oregon. And it does keep changing. And what they started out as was branch lines of the class ones. And then when the class ones were trying to get lean and mean, they peeled them off and sort of hoped they would go away. Um, but in many cases, other activity grew up and they're actually mostly quite busy. So they need to feed into the class one system. And I call it the tributaries into the class one rivers. And about 90% of what the short lines generate has to get in and out of the class one system. And then maybe the the other 10% is just local. Um, but it's, it's a big challenge. And we have you know, some competing short line service in the north-south corridor. But in the east-west corridor, we only have the UP. And there's really no way to cobble together short lines that would get us east-west and provide competition. The other things now, we remember we started with a TRB list of issues and an AASHTO list of issues. Um, the additional issues that I put on this um, from the Oregon viewpoint was the, the marine system, the Columbia Snake system is the second largest and hugely important to our economy. Security, which the TRB did touch on, and then the financing issue, which I keep harping on. Um, this is a map of the marine system in Oregon, and it's really inextricably tied to the Washington system. Here's the Columbia River and up into the Snake River system. Um, and you'll notice the Port of Portland is 100 miles upriver. And unlike the other West Coast ports, you have to have a bar pilot to get you over the Columbia Bar. And then you switch over and get a different pilot to bring you down the river. So it's a big deal to come into this port. And that's a geographic deterrent we can't do much about. Um, consequently, and also because Oregon has a very small population, you see from this that we're not, Port of Portland is not in the top 10. Um, and actually, I don't know its rank, but it's considerably lower. We handle about one hundredth of what LA Long Beach handles. So 
that's well and good at the national picture, but at the local picture, we desperately need a healthy port because it's our only outlet right now. It's our only deep water marine port. All our other ports are river ports that handle barges. Um, this is a rather funny picture that I couldn't move up the page better. But anyway, um, here it says LA Long Beach was handling 71% of the West Coast volume versus 75% in a good year. This was the bad year when they had so much congestion and vessels tied up waiting to get in and a big fuss. Well, it dropped from 75 to 71. And the whole rest of the West Coast, counting the Port of Oakland, Port of uh, Tacoma, Seattle, Vancouver, handled this piece of the pie. So, you know, we're in that little burgundy piece, but we're very small. Um, now I have some details about the various port systems, and I covered that about the, the Port of Portland. The Columbia Snake System, I've touched on how important that is. Produce comes from all over down that system. And um, again, the flows are both from Washington and Oregon and Idaho. Um, if there were a breaching of the Snake River dams, a lot of that barge traffic from well, the first proposals around the Snake River would wind up having to go by truck and rail. And we've already seen that would be pretty challenging. And this thing keeps coming up in Congress. It doesn't seem clear yet where it's going. But this time, uh, there seems to be a little more energy behind it. So obviously, Oregon's going to say, well, you know, this is not good for us. It may be good for the fish, but we really need to balance the whole economic system because we've had, we've had river traffic on the Columbia from early, early years, and we're very, very reliant on it. So we, I'm not sure that voice has been well enough heard. Um, and one other port on our coast, the port of Coos Bay is interested in becoming a deep water port, and that would give us another alternative to Portland, although it would be very tiny, and the, the railroad, the Corp line, the Central Oregon and Pacific line that serves Coos Bay is an old line that needs a lot of work on its track. and um, you can't just make the port work. You can't just deepen that harbor and make the wharves. You've got to obviously have the, the hinterland system of a good freight system to make it all uh, handled properly, and that's going to be a huge amount of money if it ever comes off. But they are pretty ambitious to do it. And then I put in a picture just about um, the air freight service, which uh, we have um, a number of important airports. So obviously Portland is the biggest and then <clears throat> there's not much happening in eastern Oregon, actually. Pendleton has service. Redmond is growing very fast. Rogue Valley has scheduled service. There's a little bit from Klamath Falls, um, Eugene. Um, and all of those airports have the potential for more air freight, as well as I haven't even touched on general aviation. And general aviation handles a lot of... Um, unquantified freight, flowers, blood and human organs, um, used to be a lot of photographic stuff, canceled bank checks, um, and none of that's actually tabulated in any efficient way, so we don't have data on that, and we don't really have even information on freight operations from the smaller airports. But it, it's something to put on your radar because there are, um, as I said here, about six scheduled service airports in the state, but there are about 50 important airports in the state system. And nationally, um, there are about 4,000 airports in the, in the, what they call the National Plan of Integrated Airport Systems, the NIPIAS. And of those, less than 1,000 have scheduled service. So there's a lot else going on than just the airlines. And I think that's a sleeper that, if you're interested in this, you want to keep your eye on. I touched briefly on safety. Um, so if you are in your car waiting for a train to go by, in this day and age that train could be a mile and a half long, and the railroads don't terribly much care if they're moving that train to and fro and adding some cars or doing whatever they want to do. Uh, they don't operate on a schedule with most freight trains, and you may be stuck there waiting. Um, do not go around it in any way. The um, 
crush strength of a freight train, even moving at, at a fraction of a mile an hour, is as the crush strength of your car to an empty pop can. Um, and it takes a freight train about a mile to stop if it's going at any speed. Um, I knew of a case in Seattle where there's a place called Golden Gardens where the rail track is between the ocean and a little park. And a doctor who was on the beach got bored, wanted to go home, and there was a freight train parked there. So he, after waiting a bit, he crawled under, and it started to move. And even at that tiny movement, he was crushed. And um, the, the point of this slide, which, of course, is intended to be a little humorous, is um, that as we get busier, there's more and more conflicts, and grade crossings are a big deal. Uh, level crossings, not grade separated, are a huge deal because we can't run fast trains, we can't run safe highway systems when everybody's trying to cross each other like that, especially as everything gets bigger. Um, but the cost of fixing those grade crossings, especially in urban areas, is tremendously expensive because you're either going to go under or you're going to go over and the approaches to that then mean you're going to take out property and it's just um, a big deal. And then security, which I don't have a slide on, but is also a big deal. As I'm sure you're aware, after 9-11, security became a huge focus, especially in aviation. And now the attention is getting more and more to marine and other freight security, and we're far from having a secure system. But it's costing the shippers and the carriers a lot of money to begin to ramp up and get those things done right and more and more regulations. And, and we, we need that. You know, there's been horrible cases where a container arrived full of illegal immigrants who died on the way. I remember that one in Seattle, too. You know, there needs to be um, more security as things are packed and loaded and sealed and bonded um, and more ways to scan what's in them. But we're a long way from doing that, and there's still a huge number of loopholes in that system. Um, anyway. Now we're on the financing topic. So anyway, the system is broken. And I would say it's a, it's a call for real concern because it's not like we're 10% short and what are we going to do. This is we're many, many times short. And um, for example, in the Oregon Transportation Plan, a calculation was done looking at the, the purchasing power of the gas tax. This is the gas tax. And it hasn't been raised since 1993. It's 24 cents on the gallon. And here's the vehicle miles traveled going up and up. And if you were to look at uh, construction costs for highways, it would look like this. Because we've had something like 20% cost increase in the last several years in a row. And so clearly, this is not a workable financial plan. The state gas tax is not going to cut it. And uh, you know, a possible first step would be just indexing the gas tax to inflation. So if it's 24 cents a gallon, uh, let's say gas was $3 a gallon, which was a while back, then that would be 8%. So if it was indexed as something like that with a floor so it never made less money than what we're making now, um, in the beginning that wouldn't even really be a tax increase. I mean, it, right now, what's it, about 250 so we'd have to get up there again, but I think we're going to. Um, and indexing is one discussion, and actually increasing taxes is another, but to do it right, um, it's a very large increase. And any of you that are familiar with Europe know there's been huge gas taxes for years over there. And like in Britain, more than half the cost of your gas is, is probably a tax. Um, but it's helped to both um, promote use of other modes and it's created a revenue stream. Well, we are now facing some questions. And at the federal level, that's not going to bail us out either because by 2010, Congress tells us the Highway Trust Fund will be empty. There will be more coming out than going in for part of the same reason. The federal gas tax isn't indexed to inflation either, and their calculations relate also to some conservation. So if you're relying on a gas tax but you sell less gas because you're conserving, then obviously you've got a revenue drop just from that, which is a good thing to conserve gas, but we have to figure out another way of getting the revenue. And also, um, 
the safety loo bill that was passed, the, the transportation bill we're working under, um, was underfunded in the first place. When it finally went through, which took about two years longer than it should have, it was about a hundred billion less, I think, than everybody wanted, and that's where the administration pared it down to. And even since then, um, it's been cut further because of money being siphoned off for Iraq and that kind of thing. So, so we don't have an adequately funded federal program. We don't have an adequately funded state program, and that's true around the whole country. Um, so. Is this what we're heading for? Is this our commodity flow system of the future? Um, I hope not, but there's going to be some really good minds looking at the issue. But um, we do have a problem, and I'll come back to that in a minute with some of the later stuff. But I wanted to touch on this issue with the whole business of freight growing so fast and being so important to our lives and to the economy. Um, what thinking has to change, especially in the state DOTs? And I would say typically the state DOTs, they call themselves DOTs, but they've actually been highway departments, and they may have a little of this and that in other modes. In Oregon, we have the highway division. We have a rail division that's mainly focused on rail regulation. The aviation department is a separate state agency that used to be part of ODOT. And the marine is handled by the um, Oregon Economic and Community Development Department. And then pipeline is handled by about 10 different agencies. So I couldn't even list those off for you, but it's the forgotten stepchild of all this. Um, every state's different as to how it's organized. Um, but given that highway focus, the main emphasis has been on infrastructure. We have engineers who know how to build and design bridges and maintain pavement and all of that. So there's, a, there's, there's that infrastructure emphasis. There isn't what's needed now, which is a customer emphasis. Freight cuts across all the infrastructure. People movement cuts across all the infrastructure in a different way. Um, but that shift from we know what to build and how to build it, to we need to find out what everybody needs and then find the best ways to accommodate it, is a real mindset shift for, for state DOTs. And as I was sort of hinting at before, to do the freight part, you also have to have a grasp of your state economy, what your producers are producing and why and where's it going, what's changing fast, what's changing slowly, what's at risk for leaving the state because it can't get enough of this or that. Uh, what's going on in the national economy and what's going on in the international economy that may affect your state. Um, and again, that's not something, there's no school yet to go to really to be a freight planner. It's happening slowly and there are places where you can specialize, but it's, it's not been until maybe what, the last five, six years? It's not been a real academic focus. Um, and it certainly wasn't recognized when I was in school. When I, I wanted to do transportation, I couldn't even find a place to specialize in transportation. So anyway, um, but on the other side, the shippers and carriers, uh, they need to learn some different things too. They need to learn how to partner with government and understand our processes. Um, some of them, for instance, the UPs often said in the past, well, we don't really want government money because um, we don't want all the red tape that goes with it and the, the conditions that go with it. But the, the big railroads, the class ones, are not going to be able to build the system that's needed unless they partner with government in some way to get some of the money. Um, then I touch again on data. You know, there's a huge amount of data in waybills and whatnot that all these private operators gather. But normally they wouldn't want to share it with the public sector because it's confidential. Um, we can't plan the freight system if we don't have better data and some of it from the private side. And last but not least, getting them to be a little patient with the process because government is committed to an open process involving all the stakeholders. And, um, you know, uh, they're working with this week's crisis, this quarter's financial returns, and here am I talking about 30-year planning time horizons. It doesn't mesh very well, but we need to understand that about each other and find a middle ground. 
So, um, and I want to speed up a bit because time is going by. Ramping up to deal with freight, there's a lot going on. Federal Highway has a wonderful freight mobility office. Ashto has staff people dedicated to freight. There are a number of multi-state organizations. I mentioned the West Coast Cardo Coalition. Um, many states now have a freight unit like mine that I manage. Um, many states are doing freight planning either as part of a bigger transportation plan or um, you know, uh, on its own, a standalone, and many more are getting to, into advisory committees. And the most recent thing from the feds is a national freight policy framework, which is just evolving. And it has seven areas, which I can talk about at the end of this time. Um, so I showed did a survey, who's really pumped up about freight in the DOTs? And we got a few extremes. And so that was about 23%, 54% somewhat. So we're actually getting there, that people have this on their radar. And the, the not varies and the not at alls was only in the range of 6%. So, and this survey covered 47 states, so it's a pretty good indicator. Um, who's got a freight section? I'm sorry, this got cut off a little bit. but. Um, when you count the red and the blue, um, the vast majority of states have a freight function, either as a separate freight unit or buried in a bigger group, and that is new. Um, Safety Lou in the last round actually had language that said every state must have a freight mobility unit, and then that got dropped from the bill, but some states got on it and started to work on that, and I think Oregon was one of them. That's probably why our section exists. Um, this was about whether um, freight planning includes specific projects. And this is an important issue that we're debating in Oregon because we lean away from project-specific plans. But at the same time, if you want your stakeholders to get pumped up about funding something, they've got to know what they're buying when they say, yeah, tax us more. Tax us more for a pig in a poke. No, tax us more for this list of things we know is needed. Um, so I think that's a really important issue. Um, and then I mentioned the national freight policy, which people are beginning to get familiar with. And, and then the question of whether there's a freight advisory committee. We've had a freight advisory committee in Oregon since about 1998, and it's top industry people, either shippers or carriers, um, who get with us every three months and talk about what's needed. And they advise the, the ODOT senior staff, and they advise the Oregon Transportation Commission, and my section staffs that. So that's a growing thing. It looks like, based on this survey, almost everybody has either a formal or an informal conversation with industry groups. Um, in terms of needs, now I feel like Carl Sagan when we get to needs, billions and billions and billions. I mean, when you tally it up, there's just huge unmet needs, and um, where numbers come from all over, and I'm not going to dwell on them. You've got them in the handout. Uh, the Freight Advisory Committee came up with four to five billion dollars worth of need just for highway stuff. Um, <laughs> rail has all sorts of needs. Again, this is the Portland Triangle, and there's just massive needs just in that area. Marine, they came up with something like two billion that wasn't funded yet. Aviation is actually not known right now. Uh, oil and gas pipelines, really not known either. Um, and then I wanted to touch on Connect Oregon, which is hot right now in the legislature, which is really a drop in the bucket, $100 million program. It's about to be renewed, but it is an important step because it's funding for non-highway projects. So that's, that's going on right now, and I'll, um, I'll be glad to talk more about that if you're interested. It, it covered rail, aviation, marine, transit projects, and I say not highway. Um, so what's going on in terms of innovation? Well, we've had the big OTIA program that I mentioned in Oregon. We're looking at innovative public-private financing through a toll road, and you may have heard about the Newburgh-Dundee project. And in some states, like Florida has 40-some toll facilities already, and a lot of the East Coast states, it's normal. Um, but here we had tolls in one or two places, and then when the thing got paid for, took the toll off, so it's no longer part of people's normal thinking. Uh, but we probably need to go to that. We're also experimenting with a vehicle miles travel tax. So at the gas pump, 
you pay for the mileage you did in the last time since you filled up rather than for the gas you bought. And that's, that's still a pilot project that Oregon initiated that may be one of the ways of the future to pay for the system. Um, Safety Lou set up two commissions that have almost the same purpose to look at the whole national financing picture. I've talked about the gas tax question. Um, and if I were, you know, if I were queen of the transportation world, I would say let's index it today at the state and federal level and let's, let's get up to $1.50 uh, a, a gallon over a series of maybe 10 years to where we have the money that we need. Um, there's been some talk of a freight trust fund in the next safety loop. And again, nobody knows where the money's coming from. You can't make new programs if you don't have new money. But the idea of a, a portion of the, of the program that's dedicated just to freight would really um, make a big push to the states to match that at their end and, and have a program. Um, and then one of the things that's interesting, a 25% proposed tax credit to the Class 1 railroads. That came up last year in Congress and didn't get anywhere. This year it looks like it will get somewhere. And they're basically saying this is a way that we can find some money to do railroad investments that we know are needed. But if you remember that map that I showed you with the UP and the blobs of where they're focused, it's not Oregon. And I've discussed with them, well, is this going to be in proportion to track mileage so we'd get some of that benefit? They go, no, we know where the needs are. So it's Oregon taxpayers helping to fund something that doesn't directly help us. Um, when we get into our statewide freight plan, which we're just about to kick off, uh, obviously we know we've got to talk to all the stakeholders. And this picture was kind of, this was taken at the Multnomah Falls parking lot. And it, it sort of symbolizes to me tourists use the road, tourists are a part of the state economy. There's lots of other users of the system, and we can't do freight planning in a vacuum. And that's a huge topic as to how to organize all the input. Um, now, some personal observations. This is my last slide. Um, so we've seen these huge growth trends of freight, both for Oregon and nationally. And I'm, I'm sitting here going, you know, is this really plausible? Do we need to think about where we're heading in the long run? Um, so the first thing is world population growth. There are going to be a lot more consumers around the world who all aspire to an American lifestyle. Um, and the population is growing faster in the third world. I mean, Japan, for instance, is losing population. Um, we've already seen competition from Asia for fuel, for rebar, for concrete. That's partly why our prices have gone up so much for our construction. And that's just going to continue over the long run. Um, another thing, last week it was reported in the news um, that, that our balance of trade deficit in 2006 was somewhere between six and seven hundred billion. And that works out at more than two thousand dollars for everybody in this country living on essentially thin air. I mean, can we continue to be the world's consumers where everybody else is the world's producers and we aren't paying our own way? We're living on credit in various different ways. I mean, to me, this doesn't make sense in the long run. Um, so what, when I am obliged to do long-range planning, what, how can I position us for the kinds of shifts that may come? The whole fossil fuel thing and peak oil is one big thing that we know is on the horizon somewhere in that 30-year time frame. Um, but beyond that, all these other issues about what's going on in, in the world economy um, and how can Oregon prepare to still be healthy and sane um, if there are big quantum shifts. Has anybody read the book, The Long Emergency? Okay, well, I recommend that. Uh, that, that talks about life after fossil fuels. And um, one of the things that comes out, though, is things may be more local. You know, Oregon used to grow more food. We didn't import things from Mexico and Chile in the early days. We grew it here. and and we could easily be self-sustaining in food. And, you know, we don't. The average meal travels 2,000 miles to get to your plate. Does that make sense? Is food miles an issue? 
If I can go to the health food store and buy almonds from Sicily that traveled 8,000 miles or almonds from California that traveled 1,000 miles, is, is this rational? You know, if I can stand on a bridge and watch the freeway traffic and see manufactured homes going this way and that way up and down I-5, so they're ordered in Nevada and made in Washington and they're ordered in California and, and delivered from Oregon. And is this, again, is this rational? If we get to where 50% of the final cost of a manufactured home is transportation, don't you think some of those manufacturers will pool their designs and make each other's products so you can buy it from 50 miles away? Is this what we may see in the future? Well, you know, I think so. I think it's rational. Um, I think it would save fuel. It would save us trying to heighten all our bridges and a few other things. Um, so I think, in, you know, part of my mission is to wake everybody up that freight's important and we need to plan for it. And then having done that, the other part is to say, but wait a minute, you know, do we really need to go crazy over this? Because um, I think instead of this kind of growth trend, it's going to be more like this. And we need to look at what some of those shifts may be and, and be prepared for them so that we can still be a healthy economy but on maybe a more sustainable basis. Okay, that's the end of my spiel. Yeah. Uh, so you uh, sort of began and ended your talk with uh, this idea of, of leveraging transportation to get cheap goods from far away and, and mm -hmm. how rational that may or may not be. Uh, and then another theme throughout your talk has been uh, this idea that we're at capacity and so it seems that those the, the, that you might be able to kill two birds with one stone by promoting this this sort of local, you know, development, local mm -hmm. production uh, that you might also have an answer to the capacity problem. Um, do you do you can you think? I mean, do you have any mechanisms by which you might be able to uh, to accomplish that in mind? We're we're in a sense we're looking for mechanisms because. Um, as we do the freight plan, what we're looking for is the best possible tools to say, if we recommend infrastructure investment here in item X, we get result Y in the economy. And we need to rank our investments based on those economic results. And we need to think about which of those economic results we really want, um, and, uh, in a sense. But there are no, there are no handy-dandy tools to just do that. And it may be... Like, for instance, in Connect Oregon, there are, in the current bill, there are six considerations. They need to be turned into performance measures, and we need to say, okay, whichever projects come closest to hitting these measures are the ones that will get funded. Um, and those are based on, you know, what our bigger goals are. But, uh, you know, as a transportation agency, we're kind of the tail wagging the dog because we don't do... We don't run the economic development department, and the economic development department doesn't run the economy. You know? So um, uh, we can only do so much, but I think, I think we can raise the questions. And the governor's got a real focus on sustainability, and we need to keep on asking, what does that mean? You know, if you go back to the original natural step, thinking about sustainability, it was no new resources which would put us at a pre-industrial revolution standard of living. And I don't think we're talking about that, but we are talking about living a lot more efficiently. And it's all, it's all tied together. You know, can you shop at a farmer's market and support a local organic farmer versus having stuff flown in or brought in from Chile or Mexico or whoever knows where else? Um, okay. So, so maybe, so sort of... To summarize, sort of to, to put local production for local consumption, at least in your criteria when you're when you're evaluating new new yeah. development, well, I new would, projects. I would choose to do that, and we're not that fine grained at the moment, but yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about about the uh, Columbia River crossing project? Uh, to what extent is that is the current crossing a bottleneck for freight in the state, and to what extent will the options that are being discussed help alleviate that? I'm, I'm not myself working on that project, so you'd be better off talking to the project team. The lead of that is John Osborne. Um, it's our top freight concern. It's a, obviously, it's a huge bottleneck. Um, Kansas City, which is 
probably about the size of Portland, has seven river crossings to our two. It's clearly a need. Um, we have a we have a three-person front office to serve the whole state, so we have we can't get into individual projects in a lot of detail. What we're hoping to do is provide guidelines for individual projects, so they can be done with a freight-friendly focus. Bob, did yeah, you? I'm actually I'm, uh, I'm Bob Lear, I'm a freight planning coordinator here at the City of Portland, and I'm also part of the Columbia River Crossing project team. Uh, yeah, they're actually, next week, the, uh, the Columbia River Crossing staff has uh, made a recommendation to the 39-member task force, which is the local decision-making body for that project right now. And they're recommending three basic alternatives at this point. One is a no-build, which is something that we carry forward in part of an EPA document. The other is to build a new bridge with either light rail or bus rapid transit, and to take down the existing bridge, basically. So that's working through the process right now. It's still very early on, and there was a big meeting last night at Metro. It was out to pretty late. And Metro was weighing in on some of the recommendations as well, because Councilor Rex Burkholder is uh, he's representing Metro on the CRC task force. So but that's currently, they're, try they're in a pretty aggressive schedule right now. But I think there's, they're still looking at some different alternatives and how to uh, maybe look at lane use, uh, TDM, TSM alternatives in terms of addressing congestion. but. One of the things that we found looking at that project and doing some traffic analysis on Interstate 5, I mean, it is a major freight corridor. And I was just at a couple community meetings a couple weeks ago, and, you know, there has a lot of local impacts on it, but, I mean, it's still Interstate 5. I mean, it's one of the, it's the major, one of the major trade routes, the surface trade routes of Canada Mexico. You know, it comes right through our city. And a lot of the truck traffic, I mean, comes through about roughly 50% is one of the numbers I've seen. It actually passes through the Portland... Vancouver area. So I mean, we're getting impacts from LA, from Long Beach, and Seattle, and there's, there's freight passing through the area that way. But one of the issues, one of the problems with the uh, study, well I shouldn't say the study, but the I-5 corridor right now, which the study area goes from SR 500 in Vancouver down to just north of uh, Columbia Boulevard in Victory in uh, Portland, is a lot of traffic, is like 70% of traffic gets on or off or both within that five mile study area. So there is a lot of activity, like a lot of merging uh, issues you're dealing with right now, and a lot of high accidents at the bridgeheads. So yeah, it's a, it's a real complex, complex issue, and of course the funding of it, potential funding of it, is uh, going to be dramatic. And the issue of tolling is just re you know starting to uh, be raised right now. So, but there's a they have an excellent website, so you can just type in clubrivercrossing.com, and you can find out more about that project. Yeah. I'm just curious, you're talking about, you know, the problem with VM or the gas tax not matching the VMT, you know, we have a big deficit for that. Has anyone talked about maybe making the gas tax instead of a fixed amount or something that's indexed to inflation, making it a percentage just like a sales tax? Then it would match maybe a lot better? That's that's what it would be if it was indexed. It would be eight percent and then as cost of gas goes up it would it would garner more than twenty four cents. Um and that you know that's a that's a beginning point because it also needs to be a higher rate than eight percent to to bring in what we need, and that the, the cost of congestion study had some number as to what gas tax would need to go up to, just to cover the Portland needs. Do you remember what that number was? But it was something like a buck fifty instead of you know where we are now, um, and you can't get there overnight. You know, I think you've got to get there in so much per year till you get to where you need to be, but, uh, it, it, and it's not, I guess the other comment I've got is we can't rely on the gas tax forever because it's like the cigarette situation. You know, we've got the cigarette companies providing a pot of money for health because they've, you know, been chastised and all that, um, but eventually if sales go way down to where nobody's buying cigarettes, then it won't work. And the same with the gas tax. As fossil fuel diminishes, the gas tax per se won't work. And we need to, that's why the VMT tax is so important as an experiment. And you need something equitable. So you ca if you just do it through registration, someone who doesn't use a vehicle much pays the same as someone who drives all the time. So that's not really fair either. Um, yeah, oh, in the back here was first, I think. Uh, yeah. Along, along the same lines, um, he's got it. As much as um, you're making the point that Transportation is kind of underpriced. 
And I was wondering if you could touch on like the politics of, of maybe why that why that persists and what would be what are the limitations from the state level working within a federal system that maybe underprices transportation. <sighs> Where to start? So, speaking as a Brit, I would start by saying the problem is density, because if you have dense urban areas, you can have transit. You need seven houses per acre to make a bus line viable. I don't mean financially, just to have enough riders on it that it doesn't look silly. And yet, you know, I worked in a community that wanted to do two and a half acre lot zoning and still wanted bus service. Well, that's a factor of 17 times overly low density. I worked in downtown Seattle. I could ride the elevator down and be within a choice of transportation modes, 50 places to go for lunch. I then moved out to Boeing Field out in the boonies, and I had to get in my car and drive 15 minutes to find anything. And, and so I think we need to really teach people about the relationship of transportation and density, and then there are choices. And there's lots of talk about the new urbanism and pedestrian scale and biking and so on. But you need, you need dense cities of all sizes. Um, and Manhattan is very dense, and something like 90% of all commuters come in by one or other mode of transit. And there's a huge system of commuter rail and rapid transit and ferries and, you know, even the taxi system. And London is the same way you know, huge urban area with a very massive transit system. Um, and that will get at part of the issue. Uh, and we're underpricing in the sense that we um, don't have the money to support that kind of transit in this country, even where we have the densities. Uh, but out here in the West, we've got such low densities that it's re really difficult. I mean, Portland area has done a lot with transit. But if you live in Pendleton, you go, you know, transit's not going to help me. I'm going to be getting in my car to go places. Um, is, is there any, is there any um, in terms of like the mobility, the, you know, all the miles that everything that we use travels, you know, so in terms of, of placing taxes on that, you know, like to some extent, I mean, you, you know, if, if things yeah. would be more local, you know, uh, what would what could Oregon do to you know to start? We could teach people about these things, but they do respond to prices, right? And things right, like that. and that's that's coming out as part of the recommendation. So if this VMT tax uh, really becomes a statewide program, let's imagine how it could be. You might have so many miles per year you can do with no tax, and then a graduated tax, just like your electric bill. The more you use, the more the rate is. And that would definitely act as a deterrent. And it would, it, things that people don't do right now, like combining trips, they, they don't think about chaining trips to, to put in fewer miles to do what has to be done each day. Um, so these are all things we definitely can pursue. But it's always a combination of sticks and carrots. And, and it, it would be nice if it could all be just in with, with carrots, but somehow sticks always seem to be necessary. I don't know if I'm quite answering your question, but anyway. That's fine. Yeah. Do you know the attitude of the industry towards road pricing, congestion charge, or whatever? Um, well, the, the trucking associations are unhappy about it. I mean, for instance, the Oregon Trucking Association, I think it's safe to say, is not happy about it. But I think they see it as more than likely inevitable. They, they know there aren't too many choices. Um, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> Doesn't that strike you as odd, though? I mean, wouldn't you think that the trucking industry would be at the forefront of pushing for con for congestion pricing? Because if they could get three trips a day instead of two, it would lower their labor costs so substantially. Right. If they were paying ten dollars for a trip instead of paying fifty dollars for a driver, it would it would just seem to me that there'd be a real uh, a huge economic upside for them. So right. uh, have, you, have you had that kind of discussion, or do you find that they just think, well, that's another government program and we need to resist it? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't been involved in the, the embroiled discussion around the newburgh Dundee bypass, uh, the toll issues coming up. Um, but I think what they're saying, amongst other things, is we're okay with tolls to pay for a new facility but we don't want to necessarily see that revenue siphoned off 
for something else. If we agree to vote for it, we want to know what we're getting for our money. Um, and then there are lots of other concerns about to what extent traffic will just find ways around if you, if you make a big deferential in, in pricing. Um, but I think, I think there's, and I'm not, I don't want to be quoted, it's like I haven't had a recent conversation, but I think in the end people will see the inevitability. And part of our job in the DOT is, is to let it be known, well, you know, in these other states there's this and this and this many toll facilities and it is not causing the earth to end, you know, that it's, it is a tool that can make sense. Um, it's also getting much easier. You know, with barcode technology, you don't have to stop at a, a toll booth and find change. You can just have, have your bumper be scanned and get a bill in the mail or whatever, prepay, whatever you want to do. Um, uh, you had a question, Chris? Yeah, so we had a question from one of the web viewers. Okay. So, uh, do you think that uh, public opinion for paying for uh, freight transportation and passenger transportation is different? Um, I th yes. In terms of selling the package to pay yes. for that infrastructure. Um, everyone seems to be able to relate more easily to personal transportation because they do it themselves all the time. Um, and so this is the this is one of the paradigm shifts, if you will, if you will, is um, the people need to be aware that that truck is carrying the pizza parts or the clothing. And we need to do more to create that awareness. Um, and then I think people will begin to appreciate it better. Uh, there, you, you know, the private sector is not, not wasteful in the way that I have to admit sometimes government is. So everything they're doing is as efficient as they can make it within the constraints of the system they're working with. And, um, and so there aren't trucks out there just milling around. <laughs> they're really trying to get something done. Um, and I just think there's a lot of uh, what what the difference is, is is needs education, and then I think we're going to see a different attitude. Does that answer? I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. I have a question, uh, kind of based on what you're saying with the um, the transit system, uh, and I was wondering if there. Uh, I was wondering if. Um, there's like an effort going on uh, to promote heavy rail commuter trains, like especially in the I-5 corridor, that could alleviate a lot of the different traffic that's conflicting yeah. with the uh, the shipping freight and also enhance the rail system. Um, there is a, a, another commuter rail line being planned into Portland, um, and I don't have the details at my fingertips, but there is some work being done on that. And there's also some talk about, I know our rail administrator would like to move the Amtrak service to the short line railroad and off of P in this I-5 corridor so that you'd have one line mainly for passenger and one for freight because it's just a lot of high density of freight trains. Um, so there is potential but we need a high density of riders to make a commuter rail line work because you're gathering a lot of people to one collection. And, and that's one of the challenges. And right now, too, which relates to the conflicts and the track condition, I mean, there is Amtrak service, say, from Salem to Portland, but it's not reliable. Um, someone I knew just who lives in Salem got a job in Portland very near the train station. So I said, well, are you going to commute by train? She said, well, I can't guarantee I'll get there. You know, the train gets in at 8.30 when, it, when it's on time. But if it gets in at 9 one day and I've got an 8.45 meeting, it isn't going to work. And it's really a shame because Amtrak, that's a whole other discussion, but Amtrak has been funded on a year-to-year -year basis with never any money for long-range planning. Every year there seems to be a debate in Congress about abolishing it. So you can't do decent long-range capital facility planning if you're, if you're living hand-to-mouth like that. And until we get real about needing a basic passenger rail system, I don't think it'll change. So that's I another think. education area. Yeah. I think um, at the same time, I think it more and more is 
being open to a good marketing strategy, especially as an example today, um, northbound I-5, right outside of, right next to the Enchanted Forest, there was a fatal accident like around 6.15 this morning, mm. and that messed the entire commute. You know, so all of a sudden you're really late for that 8.45 meeting. <laughs> you know. Yeah, well that's true, yeah. Um, but we still have higher reliability on the freeways, and also there's this illusion, at least, that we have more control. Um, people think, well, I can make a decision to take a detour route, whereas if I'm in a train, I'm kind of trapped, you know. Um, and it, it's somewhat of an illusion, but, but people want that autonomy. Anyway, okay, yeah. So did you look up at the environmental issues of increased freight traffic? Like uh, truck traffic. Uh huh. So, so, so what did you look at the statistics of uh, increased uh, pollution and in freight? Um, well, air quality is going to be a big issue with the freight system, um, and we have yet to work on that. But for instance, in the LA Long Beach area, they call it the the death zone because of all of the pollution from the drayage vehicles and the other small vehicles. Um, there's some evidence that it's really a very unhealthy situation. Did, did that answer it? Yeah. So I'm concerned that's a really big topic that we need to work on. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you mentioned air freight, and there, that's increasing uh, almost as much as trucking. Yeah, uh, uh, probably more, actually. So what type of goods are being transported um, air freight and is it a large uh, amount? Well, back to your internet sales, all those little boxes from Land's End, you know, coming in by UPS Air or FedEx and then a lot of documents, so all of that whole arena of small packet and then things like um, electrical instruments and other, other valuable commodities. Um, we have some commodity flow information I could provide that's got more detail on that in Oregon. Um, but as I said, it's a sleeper in some ways because if, if we were to focus on building our small communities up, one of the opportunities we have is to take those small airports and encourage um, air dependent businesses that would be perhaps footloose industries that would locate there and create a better job base in some of the small places that need it. Um, so it's not really necessarily going to grow just as economic growth happens. It may be more of a, a conscious strategy. Yeah? Um, I took a, took a tour of the Port of Portland recently, uh -huh. and I was, I was asking the woman about you know, what was the fuel source for all the different modes, you know, because we're sitting there with the trains and the barges and the trucks, and she just said everything's diesel fuel. Mm -hmm. um, what do, what's next? What's um, next with yeah, diesel? There, I mean, is there any other, or is there any? <sighs> well, biodiesel, mm -hmm. which is um, something Oregon may be able to produce quite a bit of. But of course, that's a contentious issue too, because if you're using um, agricultural products for fuel, you may be mm -hmm. jacking up prices for farmers for feed. Um, I mean, there are lots of things being looked at, and I watched a thing on the Discover Channel the other day about compressed air vehicles. I mean, this this is also a possibility. So, um, you know, I think we're the state's in the same position as everyone else with this, We're just kind of watching what's going on. There are some bills in the legislature about new fuel systems, and I, I certainly would like to see Oregon be a leader in that kind of thing. It, but it's it's a little bit beyond what we deal with directly. Yeah. Well, I've been on the same tour, and they actually mentioned, just as you did in your presentation, security matters. Yeah. But what exactly are they afraid of? Are they afraid of a bomb in the port of Portland or <sighs> blowing up wheat? Or <laughs> <laughs> um, well, for example, if if a terrorist decided to send a letter saying, I have put some anthrax in a grain elevator and this product is contaminated, you would never know if it was true or not. You would have to sequester that whole 
elevator full of grain and, and dispose of it. Um, it depends what somebody might want to do. If somebody wants to do a, a kamikaze stunt and take out a tank farm, you know, those are pretty easy to see and they're not protected really that well. Um, it, you know, it depends how far somebody's prepared to go, but there's many, many ways in which the system can be disrupted, uh, you know, on that side. And then there's the whole the whole issue of uh, many of these tanker ships and big container ships, they have crews from all over the place. They're usually multilingual and they often don't communicate with each other very well and any one of them could come from any place and then they're docking here and who knows what they might be able to do. Um, you know, it, I, d I don't really want to speculate on some of what's possible but the point I think is that very little, only a small percentage is really secure at this point. And I'm not sure we ever can create what we might think of as security. We may be a little closer to it with our passengers. But um, if somebody wants to get us, they can, I think. And we've got to get to where they don't want to get us. But that's... Um, so, so there's really a long list and not much money at this point. It's just beginning to be on people's radar. Um. So before we thank Julie for her presentation today, the speaker next week will be Brian Greger from the Oregon Department of Transportation talking about micro-simulating micro land development with the land use scenario developer. So an R is capitalized. So they're using my R, R software anyway. So, um, so thanks, Julie, for your presentation. Yeah, thank you.